This lecture is all about primary production and energy flow. So it's the material covered in chapter 19 of your textbook. So to go through some of the lecture themes, we're going to start by defining what is an ecosystem. And that's because for the rest of the lecture, we're going to be talking about primary production. So the harnessing of energy from the sun by plants, uh, green algae and phytoplankton. And when we talk about that process of primary production, it's inextricably linked to abiotic factors like precipitation, temperature um, and the supply of nutrients. And so for the first time, we have to look at things um, f with an ecosystem perspective rather than just focusing on the organisms themselves. So we're going to talk about primary production in terrestrial ecosystems, so on land and also in aquatic ecosystems. Um, and what are the factors that might limit primary production in either of those cases? Then finally, we're going to talk about trophic levels. Um, how does energy flow uh, through different trophic levels? And what are the factors that limit the number of trophic levels uh, that can occur in an ecosystem? So a simple definition of an ecosystem is a biological community plus all of the abiotic factors influencing that community. So abiotic factors um, affect many elements of ecosystems, um, but none more so than primary production. So the fixation of energy by autotrophs in an ecosystem. So for example, probably the, the best known example would be plants turning CO2 into sugar. And primary production can be expressed as a rate, so the amount of energy fixed over a given period of time. But it can also be expressed in two fundamentally different ways. The first is gross primary production, so the total amount of energy uh, fixed by autotrophs. And the second way is net primary production, um, shortened often to NPP. So that's the amount of energy left over after autotrophs have met their metabolic needs. And what this essentially means is that uh, plants may absorb a certain amount of energy from the sun, uh, but much of that energy that they absorb and much of the carbon that they fix um, and the sugar that they produce is actually used to fuel that process of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Um, and yet more of that energy is lost from the organisms as heat. So after all of those processes take place, there's only a, a certain amount of that energy left over um, that's stored in those plant tissues. Um, and what that ultimately means for, from a practical point of view is that there's only a certain proportion of that energy absorbed by plants that's available for consumption by the next trophic level. So the concept of trophic levels is a kind of simplification of food webs. So uh, it lumps uh, functionally similar organisms together so that their position in uh, the trophic system is determined by the number of energy transfers from primary producers to their level. So the first trophic level are the primary producers. Um, so these are plants, algae and phytoplankton. Um, the second trophic level are herbivores, or some might say primary consumers. Then above herbivores, you have carnivores or secondary consumers. And then above that, you might have one or two more uh, trophic levels of carnivores that feed on the carnivores uh, from the previous level. Um, so in addition to that, you have things like parasites and detritivores that consume um, uh, material at all trophic levels, um, and they also function as prey. So we're going to talk now about patterns of primary production in terrestrial and then aquatic ecosystems. So for the purposes of this lecture, um, I'm keeping the idea of primary production very simple and broad. I'm actually going to cover the process of photosynthesis and some elements of um, nutrient cycling in two other short lectures. So on land, uh, the variables that are most important for um, driving uh, primary productivity are temperature and moisture. So the highest rates of primary productivity on land occur in warm and moist conditions. So if we take Canada as an example, 78% of net primary productivity occurs in boreal forests. So that's even though forests only occupy 40% of the land. And you can visualize why that is when you look at this remote sensing map of Canada. So 
Um, it shows based on reflectance the level of net primary productivity um, across the country. And you can see really low levels of net primary productivity in the north of the country because these are extreme cold climates. And also for the same reason you see low productivity in the Rocky Mountains and the Pacific Coast mountain range. There's also a, an area of low productivity um, in this, the bottom centre of the country here, uh, which is called Pallister's Triangle. And productivity is low there because um, conditions are very dry rather than being very cold. So this just uh, shows really nicely how uh, temperature and moisture affect um, net primary productivity and are the major driving forces behind it. Maps like this and the use of remote sensing are also a really great example of how when we um, address questions about ecosystems and questions on really large scales, we have to use different tools. And often we're looking at things um, from a much broader perspective. So while net primary productivity has been directly measured in many ecosystems, um, we can actually use um, another proxy for net primary productivity. Um, which is actual evapotranspiration. So AET, or actual evapotranspiration, is the amount of water that evaporates and transpires during a given time period, and it's measured in millimetres of water. So what Rosenweig in 1968 did was he plotted um, net primary productivity, which had been measured um, in a whole host of ecosystems, against the actual evapotranspiration in those ecosystems. So you can see AET, AET on the x-axis here and net primary productivity on the y-axis and you see that kind of perfect correlation between the two. So this is completely logical. We know that um, net primary productivity is influenced most by moisture and temperature. So as temperature rises and moisture increases we know we're going to see um, increased evapotranspiration. And so it's not surprising that these um, these metrics match up with each other so nicely. But what it means is that rather than painstakingly measuring net primary productivity, we can use actual evapotranspiration as a proxy um, so that we can estimate productivity over larger scales. And that's exactly what was done in the previous slide with that aer aerial image um, that used satellite remote sensing. When we're comparing the uh, net primary productivity of uh, sites within the same ecosystem type, um, we can actually just use precipitation or rainfall as a predictor for productivity. So this graph shows um, a plot of many different ecosystems um, plotting precipitation in millimetres per year against net primary productivity. And you can see that almost perfect correlation but there is kind of um, variation at any given precipitation level. You see sometimes a fair degree of variation in net primary productivity. So the question is, what's the factor that's driving that variation? Um, and the answer most of the time is uh, availability of soil nutrients. So beyond temperature and moisture, the factor that has the biggest influence on terrestrial primary productivity is uh, nutrient availability or soil fertility. Um, and this has been shown in a number of uh, important experiments. So Shaver and Chapin in 1986 added fertilizer, um, so nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium, um, to plots in the Arctic tundra. And what they showed was those fertilized plots um, showed an almost 100% um, increase in net primary productivity. And this is kind of surprising because these habitats in the Arctic tundra would seem to be habitats where plant growth might be limited by other factors like temperature. Obviously, the temperatures are really low here. But even in places like this, the addition of nutrients um, leads to significant e increases in net primary productivity. So we're going to switch now to talking about patterns of uh, primary productivity in aquatic ecosystems. So in aquatic ecosystems, primary production is generally limited by nutrient availability. Um, and this positive relationship between nutrient availability and the rate of primary productivity um, has been documented um, in many ecosystems all over the world. The importance of nutrient availability for primary production in lake ecosystems has been shown really nicely 
um, in whole lake experiments in the experimental lake area in northern Ontario. And so experimenters, um, in this case Findlay and Cassian, um, divided lakes into two distinct areas by using a kind of nylon curtain um, across the lake's shortest point. Um, and what they did was fertilize one half of the lake and leave the other half unfertilized. And you can see the results um, or the effects on phytoplankton biomass um, on the graph on the left hand side. So after one lake was fertilized you see this huge increase in productivity um, and the increase in biomass in phytoplankton. Um, and then over several years following um, fertilization you see that phytoplankton biomass slowly dropping back off to the same level as the control lake. And so here you can see this huge uh, peak in productivity that's driven entirely by nutrient additions. Nutrient availability is also the main factor governing primary production in marine habitats. So this map shows primary production across the world's oceans. And you can see the, the high points of primary production in red um, are along coastlines where there's runoff from land that contains nutrients and there's also more physical and biological disturbance here that causes um, bottom sediments to be kind of flushed up. There's also increased nutrient availability um, where there's kind of upwelling in the oceans that brings nutrient laden waters from the ocean depths to the surface. And this tends to be concentrated along the west coasts um, of um, all the continents uh, due to prevailing winds and water movements. There's a really unfortunate phenomenon that provides um, additional support for nutrients being the controlling factor for primary production in marine habitats. And that's the occurrence of ocean dead zones. So these are huge areas of the ocean where literally no marine life survives. And they can be up to 15,000 kilometers uh, in size, kilometers squared in size. So this picture here shows um, a huge uh, bloom of toxic red algae um, and this is kind of the starting point for ocean dead zones. So they usually occur at the mouths of large rivers where lots of nutrient rich waters are being flushed out into the ocean. And that nutrient enrichment leads to eutrophication or algal blooms. And as that algae eventually dies, um, microbial activity associated with uh, decomposition of the algae increases. And those heterotrophic organisms conducting the decomposition consume all, all of the available oxygen, leaving the water too oxygen depleted for any marine life to survive. So in this course up until now, we've spent most of our time trying to understand uh, community dynamics and ecosystem dynamics through an intimate understanding of the organisms themselves. But Robert Lindemann in 1942 had a, a different approach, um, and that was to not really look at the organisms themselves, but but lump them into broad trophic groups and then look at energy transfer between those groups. And very quickly when he looked at transfer of energy from primary producers to herbivores to carnivores, he determined that there was inevitable loss of energy um, as energy moved between those different trophic groups. And it's easier to, to understand those energy losses when we, we think about the basic laws of thermodynamics. So the first law of thermodynamics is that the total amount of energy in the universe is constant. So therefore energy can only be transformed, it can't be created. So plants transform solar energy into plant biomass and herbivores transform plant biomass into herbivore biomass and carnivores trans transform herbivore biomass into carnivore biomass. But as we move up these trophic scales, um, there's no way for new energy to enter that system unless it's through sunlight being converted to, to plant biomass. And so it's only at that lowest trophic level that new energy can enter the system. And so as we move up the trophic levels, inevitably there's going to be a reduction in the energy that's available. The second important law of thermodynamics is entropy, essentially that heat energy will move from a warmer body to a cooler one. So um, all of the energy that's stored in, say, um, herbivores, the trophic level that is herbivores, um, some of that energy over time is dissipated as heat. So as uh, cells within the body of a deer pr 
perform cellular functions. Heat is produced as a byproduct, and that heat is just lost to the atmosphere. And so slowly, um, some of that energy stored within each trophic level is just lost through entropy. What these uh, energy losses mean is that if we graph the distribution of energy among trophic levels um, in ecosystems, um, we always get um, relationships that look like these. These are um, referred to as trophic pyramids or Eltonian pyramids because Charles Elton uh, was the first person to suggest this, uh, this pattern. Um, so we have most of the energy in ecosystems occurring um, in primary producers and then sequentially less and less energy, significantly less energy at each trophic level above that. So the loss of energy between trophic levels in a system was shown really nicely by the work of James, James Gose in 1978, who studied energy flow in the Hubbard Brook Experimental Forest. So he quantified energy inputs to the system um, from the sun as kilocalories per meter squared per year. And then he assessed and measured what happened to all of that energy. So of all of the energy coming down from the sun, 15% was reflected off as light, 41% was lost as heat. The process of evapotranspiration cost the plants 42% of that energy, and a further 1.2% was lost as, uh, through respiration. So ultimately, if you add all of that up, those energy losses up, less than 1% of the energy from the sun is actually assimilated and, and produced into plant matter. So that means that less than 1% of that solar energy is then available as standing plant biomass for consumption by herbivores. And obviously those herbivores will then not consume all of that plant matter. And much of what they do consume, the energy will be lost through respiration and heat loss again. Um, and so this just shows um, how difficult it's going to be for an ecosystem to support uh, many trophic levels above those primary consumers. And what Ghost did was actually kind of look at the, the energy content of different animal groups within this system. And he found that proportionally in terms of the amount of energy that they represented, animal groups like large vertebrates were kind of essentially absent from the ecosystem. So... 99% of solar energy that enters a system is therefore unavailable for use by the second trophic level. Um, so these energy losses between trophic levels are then cumulative. So eventually it's, it's natural that there's going to be insufficient energy to, to support a viable population at a higher trophic level. So this energy limitation hypothesis um, seems a very plausible reason why we only tend to see kind of three or four trophic levels in each ecosystem. But there are um, other hypotheses that have been put forward as to why this, uh, there are so few trophic levels within ecosystems. So most ecosystems have relatively few trophic levels. Three to five is typical. Um, in addition to energy limitation as we move through these trophic levels, there are other reasons why uh, most ecosystems would have relatively few trophic levels. So one is just imagining what a higher trophic level would actually represent. So these would be animals um, preying upon high level predators. Um, so for example, a species that, that persisted entirely on great white sharks. So this prey animal is very rare and also very dangerous. So you'd think that ultimately natural selection would likely favour foraging for more abundant and less costly prey. So in addition to that, there may also be uh, more fundamental evolutionary constraints. So it's questionable whether the genetic raw material exists for a creature that might persist on great white sharks to actually evolve. So we've established that energy limitation um, can play a big role in determining the structure, um, the trophic structure of ecosystems. But there are also biotic factors involved. Um, when we talk about factors affecting trophic structure, uh, we tend to talk about bottom-up controls. 
So this is the influence of physical and chemical factors on an ecosystem. Um, and also top-down controls. So this is the influence of consumers. A good example of top-down control within an ecosystem was demonstrated by Carpenter and Kitchell, um, who developed the trophic cascade hypothesis. So this is the, the idea that, you, that the effects of consumers extend down to lower trophic levels. So Carpenter and Kitchell studied a simple um, marine, or sorry, a um, lacustrine or lake ecosystem, which was basically made up of large fish um, that fed on smaller fish, which themselves fed on zooplankton, which then fed on phytoplankton. So the hypothesis is that if you, for example, increase the population of large fish or pescivorous fish, that will then reduce the population of smaller fish that will then free up some zooplankton from predation and increase the population of those zooplankton. And then those zooplankton will feed more heavily on the phytoplankton, so this will reduce primary productivity. So essentially in this case, increasing populations of, of large pesc pescivorous fish has the indirect effect of reducing primary productivity in the ecosystem. So Carpenter and Kitchell tested this hypothesis by manipulating populations of fish in a number of lakes. So in one lake, for example, they reduced uh, or they removed all of the large pescivorous fish. What happened in this lake is you saw an increase in the number of, um, of smaller fish released from predation pressures. Um, those fish then fed heavily on zooplankton which then um, allowed phytoplankton to increase in population. So this led to an increase in primary productivity in the ecosystem. Conversely, in a different lake system, they increased or introduced higher numbers of uh, large pescivorous fish. This reduced uh, the numbers of smaller fish, thereby freeing up zooplankton from predation. And those zooplankton then fed heavily on phytoplankton, reducing primary productivity. So this is a really nice example of a clear trophic cascade. But until recently, most of those uh, examples that worked well came from um, aquatic habitats. And Donald Strong in 1992 kind of facetiously asked, are all trophic cascades wet? And he was suggesting that trophic cascades um, occur in ecosystems with lower species diversity and reduce spatial and temporal complexity. Um, and these are features shared by many of those um, aquatic ecosystems. But that prompted ecologists to seek examples of trophic cascades occurring in terrestrial ecosystems. So some terrestrial examples of trophic cascades have been identified. So one good one is the effect of grazing mammals on primary production um, in the Serengeti. So the Serengeti is a grassland ecosystem in Tanzania and Kenya. Um, it's one of the last ecosystems where um, large numbers of large mammals um, roam free. And McNaughton in 1985 estimated that um, grazers on the Serengeti consume an average of about 66% of annual above ground prim primary production. Um, so primary production in the Serengeti is pos positively correlated with rainfall, as you might expect, but it's also correlated with grazing. McNaughton carried out um, exclosure experiments with um, grazing wildebeest in the Serengeti, very similar to the experiments we saw with grazing geese um, in Arctic grasslands um, in an earlier lecture. So essentially he fenced off areas of the Serengeti that couldn't be uh, that then couldn't be accessed by grazing wildebeest. So he found that the areas outside of those exclosures were heavily grazed um, by passing wildebeest, um, but that the areas inside the exclosures obviously were left ungrazed. What he found was that after grazing, the grasses outside the exclosures went through compensatory growth. So their primary productivity actually increased after grazing, stimulated by that grazing event. This compensatory growth of grazed plants um, is probably down to a number of factors, maybe reduced self-shading, so the grazers remove um, less healthy material from the plants, um, exposing healthier material that can photosynthesize more efficiently, um, 
improving water balance within the plants might also be a factor. So reducing leaf area and reducing rates of uh, respiration. But what McNaughton found was that um, compensatory growth in these plants was highest at intermediate levels of grazing. So at low levels of grazing, there probably wasn't enough uh, grazing to actually stimulate compensatory growth. But at really high levels of grazing, the damage to these plants was too much to allow them to actually recover. So what this means is there's kind of an intricate balance here where um, the densities of large grazers in the Serengeti has a huge impact on the primary productivity um, of the ecosystem, with productivity being reduced at both very low and very high densities of these grazers. 